night, Elroy Jacobs and his brother-in-law, Wyatt, entered the remote icy tundra of northern Saskatchewan to make a documentary film about social isolation. The team was never heard from again. Later that summer, their footage was discovered by a group of caribou hunters. What you are about to see is that very same footage. It's a cold world out there, folks. And I'm not talking about global warming. I'm talking about the winter of the soul. I have no idea what you're talking about, but it is cold right here. It, it is cold. It's cold right here. And right here we are in the lovely northern Saskatchewan. Also known as winter's bedpan. We are here to experience the world at its coldest, a beautiful metaphor of how we have cut the heart of humanity and all we do is care more about ourselves than anything else than anybody else. Oh yes, my friends, it is cold. I have no idea what your flowery, artsy words mean. But I am freezing. <laughs> where can we find the warmth of community? Like what's found in the good book of 1 John 1, 7, where it says, we must have rich, full fellowship like that you'd find in a small group. Yes, let's go join a small group, one that meets indoors where it is warm right now. And lest I remind you of Romans 12, 16, where it says we must live in harmony. Which is just the opposite of what I'm about to do to you right now. And unlike my compadre right here, we must do what James 4, 11 says, and we must speak with wholesome words to one another. Speaking of wholesome words, parents, Please cup your children's ears, for I'm about to let go with a slew of words to express just how cold I am. I'm talking words that are generally reserved for hockey players and pageant moms. We gotta stop worrying so much about Botox and this, and there's an app for that, and text instead of talking, and we want things now, 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 and Facebook until we're foul. All right, my friend, you're just proving my point here. You're just proving my point. No, I am calling 911. And my phone is frozen. It doesn't work. I'm losing feeling in my lower extremities. Stand down. I just don't think people care anymore. Why don't you care about me? Don't get lost in the cold. Join a small group. It's what Wyatt and Elroy would have wanted. Good morning. In September, we will kick off our fall session of small groups. And we certainly don't want anyone to be left out in the cold, so I'd encourage you to join a small group. We have either 27 or 28 small groups ready to go, 27, 28 small group leaders that want you to be a part of their small group as we explore and learn more about one of our core values, life and community. Some of our small groups have been around since we started small groups, such as the Vans. Others are brand new to this year. So if you haven't done so already, in any of the lobbies you can pick up a small group directory. There's a listing of all the small groups. I'd encourage you to take a look through those, see if you can find one that will help you in your journey. And if you have any questions about the groups or which one might be best for you, please call, email, stop by to see me. I hope that when you came in this morning, you also picked up a bulletin. A lot of good information in there. There is a perforated section that we would ask uh, members to fill in uh, on, on the member side and guests to fill in on the guest side just so we have a record of your attendance. Just a few notes uh, as we get started this morning. There is a uh, TYM, Twickenham Youth Ministry Parents Meeting. That will be immediately after uh, our time together this morning in the XP3 room on the youth hallway. Since a lot of folks are, will most likely be out for Labor Day, uh, we wanted to go ahead and announce that there is a shower, and it's in the bulletin on September 8th, uh, for David Cook and his fiancée, Erica Leary. Uh, it will be in the Mercy Building from 1.30 to 2.30. Uh, David grew up at Twickenham. He's the son of uh, Cindy and Mike Cook, um, and, and he's going to be here at the shower. And so, guys, we are invited to come to this shower. And I have been told there will be hot wings and something wrapped in bacon. Uh, but I'm not totally convinced of that. But if you can make that September 8th, please come and be a part of that. 
wanted to do something maybe a little bit different this morning, a little out of the ordinary. And so before we begin worship, what I wanted to do is maybe spend some time sharing with you uh, what we're going to talk about this morning and what our theme for the morning is going to be. Uh, and as you see from the screen, what I want to talk about is, is sacrifice and atonement. But before we get into the lesson, before we get into worship, I wanted to preface uh, what we were going to do so that we can essentially prepare ourselves and be ready to come to praise God and to reflect on what He has done for us through Christ Jesus. I know that when I come into the assembly, uh, it's not always with an attitude that is ready to worship. Uh, I'm coming from class and I'm trying to get the coffee pot turned off or I have to go get a kid and check him out of class and get up here. Or maybe you're just coming in, you miss class because uh, you're trying to get the kids dressed or, or whatever the case. Uh, and, and sometimes it takes me just a little bit to settle in and prepare to worship God. So I wanted us to pause, take a deep breath, count to ten, and set the stage for what we're going to do. And this morning's not going to be really a lesson with three main points, but I hope that in our time together we can come to a deeper and more sincere appreciation for Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And the theme of sacrifice and atonement that runs throughout the Bible and that it culminates ultimately with the death of Christ on the cross. So if you will bear with me through an extended introduction, an extended call to worship, I pray that our time this get together this morning will be meaningful. For the past uh, six or seven months, uh, the Fellowship Hall class has been going through Francis Chan and David Platt's book called Multiply. It is a book based on the premise that from the beginning of Christianity, the natural overflow of being a disciple of Jesus has always been to make disciples of Jesus. Jesus set the example as He took His disciples and turned them into disciple makers. And then He called His disciples to go to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and to teach people to obey in what we've come to know as the Great Commission in Matthew 28. So we've been looking at what it means to be a disciple and how that might translate into making disciples and to telling people about Christ. And in the final two sections of this study, we've been taking an, a, an overview of the Bible, trying to look at it as a story, trying to pull up and understand the themes that run through the entirety of the Bible and even into our lives today. Trying to understand God's plan from Genesis to Revelation to where we find ourselves today. Because sometimes we can get so entrenched in the weeds that, that sometimes we might miss what God is calling us to and we can't see the forest for the trees. So with that in mind, let me quickly bring you up to speed with the journey that we've been going through in the Old Testament to the point where God gives the law to the Israelite uh, at Mount Sinai. We started in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and we looked at creation and the incredible thing that God did when He spoke the world into existence, and what an incredible thing that was. Soon after, in Genesis 3, 1, Satan enters the scene and mankind bites, both literally and figuratively, as Satan's offer and things spiral downward all too quickly. And by Genesis 6, we see God is ready to wipe out mankind, save for Noah, but the story continues in spite of sin. In Genesis 10 and 12, we are introduced to Abraham, and God covenants with Abraham and informs him that through his offspring, all the nations of the world will be blessed. A covenant based not on anything that Abraham would do, but on what God would do for mankind. And the plan of redemption begins to unfold as God reveals His plan, or begins to reveal His plan to rescue the world from sin and to right what went wrong in the fall in Genesis chapter 3. Through Abraham's offspring, God creates for Himself a people, the nation of Israel. And He raises up Moses to go rescue His people from 400 years of slavery in Egypt. After an incredible set of miracles and the parting of the Red Sea, the Israelites find themselves following Moses to the promised land. We get to Exodus 19, and the Israelites find themselves in the wilderness. They're at the base of Mount Sinai, and God is ready to declare Israel to be His people and He to be their God. And He's ready to go into a covenant with them. And in Exodus 19.6, God tells Moses that Israel will become to Him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
Israel can now rest in the security of being treasured and protected by God. And then a little bit later in Exodus chapter 19, verses 10 through 14, something which has really stood out to me uh, this time that I've read it through, interesting happens. Exodus 19, verse 10, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. What an incredible event this must have been. And like I said, as I reread these verses, it, it just jumped out to me that, that the Israelites had to consecrate themselves to come into the presence of God. They had to prepare themselves for this specific purpose. They had to prepare themselves for an encounter with God. You see, God wanted them to be acutely aware of what was happening here. A holy God was going into covenant with the sinful people. And there was thunder and there was lightning and the ground trembled and there were going to be commandments and laws and sacrifices and the Israelites had to know how incredibly important this event was. God was doing something unique here. And He demonstrated it in dramatic fashion. Now we don't come to a mountain this morning that where there's thunder and lightning and the ground is certainly not trembling beneath us. But we do collectively come into the presence of God for the purpose of worshiping Him. And as I read this passage and I read other passages such as when the high priest went into the Holy Holies on the Day of Atonement and how he had to prepare himself to even enter into that, I believe that we also need to consecrate ourselves and prepare ourselves as we come to praise God. As we come to worship the Creator, as we come to acknowledge Christ as our Savior and our Redeemer. We need to revere Him. We need to make sure that He is in the prominent position. We need to make sure that we stand in awe of Him. Bodies were washed and minds prepared to encounter God at Sinai. And just as Israel was called to prepare themselves to meet God, should we not feel the same responsibility as we come to worship Him? So before we discuss sacrifice and atonement as we lead into the Lord's Supper, I want us to spend some time preparing for that encounter. So I'm going to ask some things from you as we prepare to worship. As we prepare, as Lincoln comes up to lead us in praise of God. First thing, these things, take them out, turn them off. Not to vibrate. Go ahead, you can do it. I'm going to set mine right there. 60 minutes. Let's give God 60 minutes of our undivided attention. Let's forget about where we're going to lunch. Let's forget about what we're going to do this afternoon. Let's try to clear our minds of issues and troubles for the next hour. And I realize that there are people sitting here today that are dealing with some really tough issues. Pain, cancer, family relationships stretched too thin, marriages that are struggling possibly on the brink of divorce, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, furloughs, sequestration, anxiety, fears, have I hit yours yet? And while all these things are important and I don't want to minimize them at all, let's try to put them on hold as best we can as we worship the God that can bring relief to all those things. And let's worship together an incredible God. Let's honor Him for all that He has done and specifically His giving of His Son on the cross for us. Would you pray with me as we begin? God, as we come together this morning, we know You're here, but we certainly don't want to take that for granted. So we invite You to be a part of our time together. Pour out Your Spirit on us. Give us penitent hearts. Hearts that seek You. As we prepare to come into Your presence and explore sacrifice and atonement in the Bible, as we prepare to worship You, we pray that our hearts and our minds will be focused on You and You alone. May all that we do be done to bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. For you have not come to what may be touched. 
a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose word made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speak a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns us from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the holy righteous judge, kindness and wisdom, and we will keep our eyes on you. We will keep our eyes on you. Let's sing together. A mighty fortress is our God. A sacred refuge is your name. Your kingdom is with you forever we will reign. Our God is jealous for his own. None could comprehend his love and his mercy. Our God is exalted on his throne, high above the heavens. Forever he's worthy, and we will keep our eyes on you. We will keep our eyes on you. A mighty fortress is our God. A sacred refuge is your your kingdom is unshakable. With you forever we will reign. So we will set our eyes on you. Lord, we will set our hearts on you. In unison, a mighty fortress is ours.
Sovereign Father, we come to you giving you all praise, honor, and glory. You have created us. You have given us life. God, we pray that in view of your mercy and grace that we would offer our bodies as living sacrifices on a daily basis. Father, as you have stated that you will shake all things in heaven and on earth again, We are waiting eagerly for your new heavens and your new earth, the home of righteousness. And Father, we're praying that your righteousness would become our righteousness, that your holiness would become our holiness, that you, you would fill us with your Holy Spirit to transform our lives, to prepare us, to change us, 
Help us to submit to you on a daily basis. Help us to love our neighbor and our enemy as ourself. God, we pray for strength and power to do this because this is outside of our nature. But your Holy Spirit gives us a power and a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And God, we pray that we would listen to your voice, listen to your spirit, and obediently follow. God, we pray that we would take the gospel of the kingdom to all the nations. God, help us to see with your eyes the world around us may seem to be falling apart, but you are in control and you have a plan. And you've asked us to join in that plan. And Father, we pray that we would have the strength, the courage, and the humility and the faith to be the hands and feet of your son Jesus on a daily basis. God, help us to sacrifice and understand what that means. Help us understand that you've offered the, the greatest sacrifice and you have provided atonement and a bridge back to relationship with you. God, help us to present that message every day to the people who are around. God, we pray for those that are hurting. Uh, we pray for those that are afflicted and oppressed. And God, we just pray for healing on the inside and on the outside, God. Help us to seek your power and not to deny uh, your sovereignty, God, but to to uh, eagerly accept your power and your, your sovereignty. God, we pray that you'd be with Steve this morning. Help him to uh, speak your word. God, we pray for this congregation that we could be a light and the salt for the community. And God, we pray that in all things we would glorify you. And it's in your son's perfect name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. At Sinai, God entered to a covenant with Moses and the rest of the Israelites. When God made this covenant earlier in Genesis with Abraham, he promised to make his descendants into a great nation, to give them the land of Canaan and ultimately to bless all the nations of the earth through them. As Israel finds itself at the base of Mount Sinai there in Exodus, they learn that they are the great nation that God has promised to Abraham. They are the ones that will inherit the land of Canaan. And ultimately, their responsibility was to be a blessing to all the nations. The implications of this covenant that God is going into with the Israelites is clear. The Lord would be their God, and they would be His people. But how could a holy God bind Himself to a sinful people? How could this sinless God maintain a relationship with people who are prone to rebel and to do the things that He hates? Israel would need to know what was going to be expected of them if they were going to live as the people of God. And that's where the Old Testament law came in. The law spelled out God's expectations for His people. It began with the Ten Commandments, and from these ten simple laws followed many more laws that governed the different aspects of the lives and the people of God. The laws were legally binding on the people, and in Deuteronomy 28, we see the list of blessings that would come if they were followed, and we see the list of curses that would come if they were ignored. And in reality, the law was never intended to give the Israelites a moral ladder that they could climb and thereby earn God's favor by showing what good people they were. The law was about maintaining a relationship with God. And it solved the problem of how a holy God can bind Himself to a sinful people. It gave the Israelites a tangible code of conduct that would allow them to faithfully live out their identity as the people of God. It taught them how to relate to God. It taught them how to relate to one another. But if God is going to bind Himself to human beings, then something has to be done about the sin that is inevitably going to come about within their lives. God's solution for the problem of sin was sacrifice. The law itself assumed that the Israelites were going to sin and break the law and fell in keeping it. 
because there was a sacrificial system that was instituted as a part of it. And that certainly was a foreshadowing of a greater sacrifice that was to come. So let's take a look at sacrifice as we see it unfolding in the Old Testament. The first hint of it, I think, occurs in the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are in the garden, they sin, their eyes are open, they know they're naked, and they initially sew fig leaves together for a covering. But a few verses later in Genesis chapter 3, 21, it says that God made Adam and Eve garments of skin and clothed them. An animal was sacrificed for those skins. And maybe this is a stretch, but it seems that as soon as sin entered into the world, God is making a way to deal with it through sacrifice. Later in Genesis chapter 22, we see God tell Abraham to take his son Isaac, the heir through whom the blessings are to come to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him. An incredible story in and of itself, but also a story that gives us incredible insight into future sacrifices to come. And as Abraham is on the mountain and he's laid Isaac on the altar and he raises his hand and it's about to come down, he's stopped by an angel of God. And a ram is provided as an offering to, instead of Isaac. And we don't need to miss what this tells us about the nature of sacrifice. Because first it suggests that God could potentially accept a human sacrifice. Though He did not allow it to go to this point until uh, the death of Jesus. And secondly, it shows us that God could accept a substitute for sin. And in this case, the ram was sacrificed so that Isaac would not have to be. Of course, it's not until we see the sacrifice of Jesus in the New Testament that the significance of Abraham's sacrifice and what happened here becomes clear. We see occasional sacrifices throughout the first part of the Old Testament, but it wasn't until God gave the law that we see animal sacrifices become an integral part of the life of Israel. And the law was specific about when to sacrifice and what to sacrifice and how to sacrifice. There were a variety of sacrifices or burnt offerings, and each type of offering served a different function. But in general, the sacrifices were designed to show gratitude to God, to demonstrate a contrite heart, and to atone for sin. That word atone or atonement is significant. And an easy way to remember the meaning of atonement is just to break it down. At one moment. Essentially, atonement is about reconciling. It's making amends for what has gone wrong. It's about reestablishing peace where there was conflict. Atonement allowed the people who were distanced from God because of their sin to once again be at one with God. So in addition to providing avenues for expressing Love and gratitude for God, the law of Moses gave the Israelites specific instructions for making atonement for their sin. Animal sacrifices gave the Israelites a tangible way of showing their sorrow and their desire to have their relationship with God restored. And they also provided a substitute that could be offered in the place for sin. One of the most striking features of the Old Testament law in the sacrificial system is the blood. There seems to be blood splattered everywhere in the book of Leviticus. And it's because the blood was necessary for an effective sacrifice. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, it says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. The blood representing life makes atonement for sin. And even though we don't need to make animal sacrifices today, the Old Testament practice still gives us a very vivid picture of sin. It was costly. But it wasn't just about the sacrifice that was being offered. The start of the Jewish New Year is called Rosh Hashanah. During this time, uh, it it is called the Feast of Trumpets. And there are ten days of repentance, or ten days all, of which Rosh Hashanah is the first, And Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, is the tenth. It is a time for reflection, of humility, of repentance. It's a time about being humble before God and repenting from sin and offering your heart to God. And we'll come back to that for a minute, but I wanted to mention it because this time for humility and for repentance is necessary because the sacrificial system instituted by God for the children of Israel 
was more than just making an offering on an altar. The effectiveness of the sacrifice was more than just the mere performance of a ritual. From the very beginning, it was about the heart of the worshiper, not about the value of the offering. In Hosea 6.6, God said explicitly through the prophet Hosea, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And probably the most startling picture of the shortcomings of animal sacrifice is found in the book of Malachi. In this book, God spoke forcefully to His people about the uselessness of their sacrifices. They had kept the outward forms and the rituals of this sacrificial system that God had instituted, but their hearts were not behind it. Consequently, they were no longer offering to God from the best of their flocks. They were simply going through the motions. And so God says in Malachi 1.10, Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. But surely God would rather have something rather than nothing. Even if it's less than our best, He must be pleased if we just give Him some consideration, right? Well, no, God actually says just the opposite. There in Malachi, he says he would rather have someone shut the doors and prevent sacrifices from being offered than to have the people making casual sacrifices. Or maybe we could put that in context of today and say he would rather have us shut the doors to the auditorium and not worship than to come in here and do it half-heartedly. Why? Well, he tells us in the very next verse. Because God's name is holy and great and it deserves to be revered. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations and in every place incense will be offered to my name. And a pure offering for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. God is actually offended by false displays of piety. And he says to the people in Malachi 2 verse 3, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. What an incredibly incredibly vivid reminder that God takes sacrifice and worship very seriously. And so should we. We are called to be living sacrifices. And it is to be done with humility and with repentance in our hearts. As we think about sacrifice, as we think about atonement, as we think about God's words, let's sing about what God has done for us. O cleanser of the mess I made, upon the hill of Hazen's trade, stretched on a cross your body crushed, by human hands new formed from dust. How
cares he wrote as from my soul these words explode how wonderful your mercy is how awesome are your ways I come I come sinners, poor and needy, bruised and broken by the fall. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pardoning love for all. Stand again. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able. Come ye weary, heavy laden, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able. Saints and angels join in concert, sing the praises of the Lamb. While the blissful courts of heaven sweetly echo with his name, hallelujah, hallelujah, hear we now his love proclaim, hallelujah. Here we now his love proclaim. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Here we now his love proclaim. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Here we now his love proclaim. Pure in heart. That I, thy holy face, one day may see. Keep me from secret sin. Reign thou my soul within. Pure.
A proper understanding of sacrifice and atonement is so helpful for those of us who tend to do good works in hopes of making up for the wrong that we've done. And just as the Israelites found atonement through the sacrifices, we must learn to put all of our hope into one sacrifice. And the New Testament clearly explains that the sacrifice in which we are to trust was made by Jesus. I mentioned earlier Yom Kippur. It was the tenth day of the Feast of Trumpets. It was the Day of Atonement. It, was insti- it is instituted and fully explained in Leviticus chapter 16 and 23. Yom means day, while Kippur means a covering or atonement. And even though there were continual sacrifices throughout the year, it was on the day, this Day of Atonement in which the people were cleansed. Every year the Israelites were to celebrate this day and God would atone for His people's sins and enable Him to dwell with them. It was a day where the nation of Israel and God were reconciled. It is a day that is still celebrated today and is still the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. It includes a day-long fast and is still a time of total rest, reflection, and humility. As we read about the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16, it is clear that God takes His worship very seriously. The chapter begins as God gives Aaron some very specific instructions on how to enter into the presence of God. And then the rest of the chapter describes what is supposed to happen on the Day of Atonement. Out of this day, out of this one day for the entire year, one man out of all Israel, the high priest, and in this case Aaron, was allowed to enter the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, and stand before God on behalf of the people. The high priest was to take with him the blood of a spotless animal. And actually, there were three animals involved in the ceremony. First, he would sacrifice a bull as an offering to atone for his own sins because he could not come to the presence of God on his own accord. No one, not even the high priest, is holy or perfect. And then the high priest would offer two goats. The first goat would be sacrificed and its blood would be smeared on the Ark of the Covenant. Picture the significance of this inside the Holy of Holies. God's presence is looking down on the Ark of the Covenant which contained a copy of the law that Israel had broken in their sin. Then the lid, which was also referred to as the mercy seat, is smeared with the blood from the sacrifice. The blood satisfied the wrath of God as it was substituted as an offering in place of the people who deserved His wrath. So instead of looking down and seeing the law broken, God looked down and saw the blood of atonement. A sacrifice had died in the place of the entire community. Their sins had been covered. I mean, try to picture the intensity of this scene if you're an Israelite. Standing outside, waiting for the priest who has entered in to make this offering on the behalf of the people. Here is a sinful man entering into the presence of the Almighty God. Imagine the joy that you would feel as he safely emerged from God's presence, a sign that the sacrifice had been accepted and that your sins had been atoned for. The priest would then take the second goat, who was alive, and he would symbolically lay his hands on the head of the goat to represent the sins of the people being transferred to the animal. And then he would release the goat to bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area. What another powerful picture of what is happening with the sins of God's people. Their sin was being removed. It was being carried off to a remote location, not to visit them again. Their guilt and their condemnation was gone. Their sin had been removed. On the Day of Atonement, the people of Israel were restored as a servant nation unto the Lord. Their sins had been covered and their sins had been removed. Keep in mind that as amazing as this feeling of joy must have been over what had happened. Over the cleansing of their sin, it inevitably inevitably faded. The ceremony had to be repeated year after year as Israel would not stop sinning. And the Day of Atonement was supplemented by this ongoing and detailed sacrificial system because Israel's sin was constant. And every time a sacrifice was offered, which was often in the Old Testament, an animal would die and blood would flow. And the blood would be splattered on the altar. Imagine, even as a young child, standing and watching this. It would have been messy, it would have been bloody, it would have been smelly, and every time you witnessed it, 
you would be reminded of the serious, awful consequences of sin. You would see a graphic representation of what your sin requires. And you would be thankful that a lamb or a goat or a bull had died in your place. And you would be thankful that on the Day of Atonement, your sins were covered and your sins were removed. In Hebrews chapters 9 and 10, the writer tells us that Christ came as our High Priest. And Christ entered into the Holy of Holies once and for all, not by the blood of calves or by goats, but by His own blood, and that He has obtained eternal redemption for us all. Because of Christ, because of what Christ did, there is no more need for sacrifice. The price has been paid. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, we read of this redemption obtained through the sacrifice of Christ. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, He says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then He adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where their sins have been forgiven, sacrifice is no longer necessary for sin. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, His body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess For He who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Everything about the Old Testament sacrificial system finds its culmination in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The sacrifices that Israel had offered on a regular basis laid the groundwork for the coming of Jesus. And when He arrived, the full significance of this sacrificial sacrificial system finally came into view. Think about it. We don't have to offer those type sacrifices any longer because Christ took care of it. He gave His life and became the ultimate atonement for us. Our sins, just like on the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, our sins have been covered and removed. Except this time, Jesus' sacrifice took care of it for all time. And now, as the writer of Hebrews says, we can approach the throne of God boldly and live in His presence. Because of this, our days need to be marked with repentance and humility. Just like the ten days of all. We must acknowledge that we are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. That we all need forgiveness. And we all need the new life that was made available through the cross of Christ. God allowed a substitutionary blood offering for our sins. Unfortunately, like the Israelites, I fear that sometimes I, and maybe you feel the same way, that we take sin too lightly. We cannot trivialize this. God hates sin. We saw what He said in Hosea. We saw what He said in Malachi. He is offended by it but He has made a way of atonement if we will recognize the horror of our sins and trust in the blood of Christ. As we come to communion, let's make sure that we remember and honor the importance of Christ's sacrifice in this communion. We don't want Jesus' sacrifice to just become a box that we check on Sunday like the sacrifices have become to Israel. It doesn't need to be something that becomes commonplace. It doesn't need to be something where we just go through the motions. We must identify with His death for our sins and put our faith in Him.
Paul would say it this way in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of Me. In the same way, after supper, He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of My blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of Me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Would you pray with me? God, we've discussed sacrifice. We've looked at atonement. What an incredible precedent was laid down in the Old Testament that came to fruition with Jesus Christ. We thank You for the sacrifice of Christ. We thank You for His atoning act that allows us to be at one with You. For the sacrifice that allows us to be in right standing with You. God, as we take this bread, give us hearts of repentance, acknowledging the gift that covered and removed our sins forever. In Jesus' name, amen.
It's critical that we understand the story of Jesus, but understanding the story is not enough. It's not enough merely to absorb the information. We must respond to it. The message of Jesus' death and resurrection demands something of us. Jesus continues to call His people. He calls you and me to follow Him and to live even though it might cost us everything. Christ's death and resurrection should give us confidence in the salvation He offers. Listen to what Peter said in Acts chapter 3. What God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that is, His Christ would suffer, He thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that He may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets long ago. As Eric mentioned in his prayer, God is going to restore all things. And one day we'll stand before Him. And I, I sort of look at it, or I like to think of it like this. <laughs> On Judgment Day, there's going to be God, and here's going to be me. And, and God's going to look at me, and what He's going to see <clears throat> is a very sinful person who deserves nothing but condemnation. And as He stands there and, and, and looks to pronounce judgment, all of a sudden, Jesus walks in front. And just like the blood that was smeared on the Ark of the Covenant, and God looked down and He saw the blood instead of the thinking about Israel breaking the laws, He looks and sees Jesus instead of my sin. Jesus has covered me. And because of what He did on the cross, He also removed those sins from me. And because of that, because He steps in for me, then I'm able to enter into heaven and live with God for eternity. And guys, that's an incredible, incredible thing. Would you pray? God, may, never, may we never take for granted or become so caught up in the world that we take this communion trivially or commonplace. May it never be something that we just go through the motions for. As we take this at juice, as we examine ourselves, touch our minds with the remembrance of Christ and a longing for eternity with you, in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, let us come to
If you have a need this morning, our shepherds will be moving to this lobby to my right as uh, we close in prayer, and we hope you have a great week. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, you will reign forever and ever. Father, we long for that day, the day when you will reign forever and ever in our lives. And Father, so we come today thanking you for all that you've done, thanking you for Jesus as the sacrifice. Be with us as we go our ways. In Jesus' name, amen.